Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. Data keeps growing. Hopefully you're working in a system that has a long shelf life. If so, the amount of data that you're storing will just keep growing over time. The problem is this can have some serious implications on performance. I'm gonna talk about different ways to think about this data and some strategies so you can make sure that it doesn't affect performance. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. So why does data keep growing? Well, let's talk about what I'm not talking about, which is really partitioning. I'm not really talking about that in the sense of like a multi-tenant application. So whether you have an internal app that you have a single tenant for, a single customer for, where it has some app compute that is running and it could be behind a load balancer with multiple instances and you have data storage. Or if you do have a multi-tenant app and you're partitioning data, so you have some pooled instances that all of the different tenants are interacting with, and again, this could be behind a load balancer, but you have a single database where the documents that you're using, the tables, the event streams, whatever the case may be, you're using a tenant ID to kind of separate that data. So in this example, we have a tenant ID, which is our partition key, and the first and third record are owned by tenant one. And then the other data is owned by other tenants. Oftentimes what people go down, and I have a video specifically about multi-tenant, is most people typically don't go down the road of having a shared compute that, again, you could be load balanced, and then having data siloed into their own storage. So each tenant ultimately has its own data storage. Hopefully you have this problem, which is you're now storing more and more data over time. This is great. This means that people are actually using your system. And if you have a SaaS based product, this means that you're gaining more and more customers and more and more people are using your system. So the performance implications with data growing is kind of obvious, but kind of not, which is it's obvious in the sense that you could think of, okay, if I have more and more data, it's going to take longer and longer to select that data or however I need to fetch it and insert data. But another issue is just thinking about that it's kind of fluid on how you define how your application works. If your application is constantly changing, and so is the data, that means that you kind of need to reevaluate re things here and then to make sure that you're still on the right path. As an example of this, if you're thinking about a relational database, you can't just decide what your indexes are gonna be at the very beginning, because the queries that you're writing, the data that you have are determining what your indexes should be. As another example, if you're thinking about an event stream, the more events that you're adding to a stream, maybe you wanna reconsider, okay, we have all these different events and maybe we should make our streams a little bit more finite. So when I mentioned finite, regardless of how you're persisting data, in my experience in line of business enterprise type systems, everything generally is finite. So there's some type of initial creation of something, of how that data looks. There's some mutation, some kind of work in progress of it and then some type of completion, finalization of how that data is. It kind of goes through this life cycle and it is finite. As an example of something like a ticketing system, maybe a support ticket is opened, then at that point it's pending as you're trying to resolve it, interact with the customer, then you mark it as resolved, and then they confirm it's resolved and then it's closed. At this point, that support ticket, it's done. How much interaction are we really gonna have with it? So for thinking about this transactional data that is finite, that kind of goes through this life cycle, is that we have all this data, but it's not all created equally. Really, we kind of have hot data, the stuff that we're interacting with actively at the moment, and users are doing with things within our system. And then once it kind of completes and goes into that finalization uh, phase, it's kind of like warm data now, where maybe we might go back to it for a reference uh, period, but we're not really interacting with it that much. So what we end up having is this mixture intermingling of hot data and warm data. And what I would like to do is just have some separation between the two, especially as time goes on, because that way we can keep that hot data very focused on what active users are using. So if we separate these, let's say just within the same database instance, as an example, if we were talking about a relational database, this could just be having tables that are hot. And then as things get finalized and go through their life cycle, move that data to the warm tables. Now I'm gonna have an example coming up in this video talking about event sourcing, but even if we're talking about this kind of separation, it could be at a database instance level. Is that we have data in our hot database, that's what we're primarily interacting with for our kind of active things users are doing. And then again, as that finalization happens, we move that data to the warm database. 
So a really common example of this is having this data separated by time. So in a line of business enterprise type system, a lot of this transactional data can be separated by fiscal year, for example. So the active kind of hot data that we're working with is currently our current year. And then more of that warm data is more historical previous years. And then as I've marked here in 2020, you can more go into cold data, which is really for archival purposes, where it's not really uh, easily accessible, but it is archived and we have it someplace that we can get to if we need to, but really not generally accessing it. So again, you can think about these things generally related to time. So there's different ways that you can implement this. First is actually just encode explicitly deciding which database, for example, that you need to connect to. As an example, if things were separated by year, what I have here is this entity framework core. I have a delegate that I'm using as a database factory where I'm passing in the year. My implementation is just simply taking that year and passing that along to the constructor of our order DB context. Then on the order uh, on configuring, this is where the logic would live to decide, okay, this is the connection string that I need to use, et cetera, and decide how and where you actually need to connect to based on the parameters that you passed in to create the connection to begin with. Another option is to take this out of code. So you're just writing code like normal, but what you're doing instead is instead of hitting the database directly, you're going to go through a proxy. Now this is gonna be completely dependent on the database that you're using, if it even has one or supports one. But if, for example, like something like MySQL has proxy SQL, which can do this, where you are ultimately connecting to it, you're sending all your queries to it, and then based off rules that you have, it will direct the traffic where needed. Another way of thinking about this data is to summarize it. So in a personal example here, I had a high degree of rights to a system that were happening all day, every day, 24 seven. And a way to alleviate this is kind of have this hot database that everything was separated by hour. So we had one database a table, for example, for every hour. And we knew when we were asserting data, we were asserting it to hour one, hour two, et cetera. And after a given period of time, when that hour was passed, then we could summarize that data and put it into our warm database. And this is what actual end users were really seeing. So we didn't have to summarize that data initially every insert request to kind of denormalize this data. We would insert all the data that was heavy, high inflow traffic every hour, then hour that after that hour passed, then we could summarize that data. Another example of summarizing is within an event stream. When I explain event sourcing, I use this example because it's usually the first question that comes up. But you can summarize with an actual business concept, something that actually does exist. So for example, we have our first event for product, uh, our SKU ABC123, and we received 10 products to our warehouse. So our quantity on hand at this point is 10. Then we received another five from another purchase order. So now we have 15 total. We shipped some product out, which is six. So now we are at nine. But it's something that actually it doesn't occur within a warehouse is doing stock counts. Because the reality of it is what the system says, in this case, we have nine, we may not really have nine. Was there a product that's broken that's on the shelf? Did some product get stolen? So what actually is on the shelf is really the point of truth. That's why they do stock counts. So maybe they do a stock count and realize actually, no, there was one product that's broken. So now we have eight. The stock count really is our summary event. At this point, if we archive the stream data, all the events within this stream, there's really no reason that we can't remove, delete these events from our stream. Because really at this point, the stock count really kind of is our beginning of the stream. It's kind of that finalization process of everything else. This makes something that may not seem finite that really has a long event stream. It is kind of that checkpoint similar to a snapshot, not the exact same thing, but similar that kind of gets us to a summary of where we are now. Another option is just simply archiving data where it no longer becomes immediately accessible. You're not deleting the data per se, you're deleting it from active storage, but you're archiving it. If you need to go get it back for compliance or regulations reasons, you have it, you can restore it, but actively in the system, it's no longer kind of in hot or warm storage. So hopefully this gives you some ideas about different ways that you can manage data growing over time. And time really is the important aspect here, is that generally you do have data that kind of has a life cycle, some type of lifespan. It's gonna be hot, it's gonna be very active while it's new, fresh, and users are iterating over it until it becomes finalized. 
At that point, at some point afterwards, that data is not gonna really get access. So it will just go into kind of a, a warm storage that you can separate that will be less performant. And then if data is really old and not really gonna be accessed at all, you can archive it, completely offload that into something cold storage where you don't have immediate access to it. But yes, you do still have the data for compliance or regulations reasons that you can restore it to get at that data. Thanks to all the developer level members on YouTube and Patreon. They get access to a private Discord server where you can communicate with like-minded developers. If you're interested in joining, check out the links in the description. If you enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment. And please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.